different story now. And that is the chief executive of Ipswich and Colchester Hospitals. And I wonder if you've seen this footage or heard what he had to say. So note, I will repeat once more what his job is. Who is this bloke speaking? He is the chief executive of Ipswich and Colchester Hospitals. He has apologised for, and I quote, being clumsy when he said hospitals are not safe places. He claimed that he was talking about patients who did not need to be in hospital. So this is a man who said, I apologise if the language I've used has offended anybody, particularly our staff. Um, and I wonder whether you heard what he said in the first place, which was this. He said hospitals are the worst place to be. His name is Nick Hume and he branded hospitals not safe. He said um, they are horrible places. The food's rubbish. We don't let you sleep. Where else would you go where you have to share a bathroom with six people? Now he says those comments were clumsy. Let's discuss this with Dr Tony O'Sullivan and Tony is co-chair of Keep Our NHS Public. Dr O'Sullivan, hello. Thanks for joining me. Good afternoon. Hello, Vanessa, again. I must say, when I, when, I, when I watched this on the television news last night and I heard this hospital chief exec make these comments, and it wasn't one of these things where by mistake he left the microphone on and he thought he was going home in the car and phoning his mum and it was all off the record. It wasn't one of those. It was not inadvertent. This is something on the record that he said at a public meeting. And I always wonder about apologising after the event for something that you said entirely on purpose in a public place. He meant to say it. He didn't say it by mistake. Well, he's apologised now, but he was clearly expressing alarm. I'm, I'm not completely sure where he was coming from, but I really hope that he's putting that kind of question to the government. You know, how can you, the government, allow this to continue? The government's been in office for 13 years now, and it's, re it's on their watch, and they have to listen to the solution. Hang on, let me stop you, Doctor, for one second. It sounds to me as if what you're saying is that he has apologised for making these statements which are, you know, critical, derogatory mm -hmm. about hospitals, dot, 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 but that you agree with them. You think he was right when he said it? Well, I, I'm, no, I didn't say that. I know, but, but it I'm, seems as if you're saying that. Are you? What are you saying if you're well, not saying okay, that? Let, well, let, let me explain a bit more then. Okay. Thank you. It, it's, it, the whole system is seriously broken. The, the whole system is under totally unforgivable pressure from hospitals to GPs to community staff to mental health and to social care. And, and, and that is the reason that there are 500 excess deaths per week. And we've established that since I sp spoke to you last. It's been clarified and yes. it's been fa fact-checked. You know, a, a, about 500 excess deaths, and that's a, a conservative estimate. Now... That, that is just shocking. We're not talking about people dying in the normal sequence of life. We're, we're talking about avoidable deaths. And it could be, you know, it could be you, it could be me, it could be our children, our parents, mm -hmm. our siblings, our friends. They are real people dying in their hundreds every week. Doctor, it, sorry, sorry to interrupt you again. So to, yeah. to just to make this, make this alive for people listening so they know what it means. Because the mm. phrase excess deaths isn't something that we are familiar with, really. I mean, you know, everybody yeah. will say, but what do you mean excess deaths? All deaths are tragic. All deaths are der desperately sad. All deaths leave families bereaved and, and, and wretched. So what does this Dr uh, O'Sullivan mean when he talks about excess Excess deaths. Excess to what? And I think they'd be fair to wonder that. So what I'd, what I'd like you to do, if you would, is to, to explain how you can, you know, an imaginary one, I'm not expecting it to be a real case, but how an excess death occurs rather than just a death. OK. Um, so, I, and, and I know we discussed this the other week, but say somebody has a heart attack or a stroke and there are very good treatments for that, uh, and there's a, an expression like a golden hour for a stroke, where if you can get uh, assessed and treated uh, after definitive scans and you get the, the best, safest treatment, you have a very, very good chance of recovery, much better than... Now, if you're waiting for, for several hours in, a, in your home with a stroke or with a heart attack for even being picked up by the ambulance, and then if you're waiting in the ambulance in the car park of the A&E, or if you're waiting in A&E before you can get to definitive treatment, you are much more likely to die. And that is the kind of death 
that is uh, is accessed and is avoidable. And and the way um, I mean, data is very important. It, it isn't. It, it can it can belie the truth. I know that. But data is based on the average numbers of deaths over a period of time mm. in the past when there wasn't something going on like COVID or something. And then you, you average out what is going on at the moment. And the Emergency Medicine Journal um, noted it against the outcome if you receive your treatment definitively within an hour or within four hours or six hours or eight hours. And the longer the delay, the more likely you were to die. Uh, so that when it got to a six or eight hours delay, there was something like a one in 80 chance of, of, uh, of uh, sorry, a, a one in 80 extra death. Mm. And that's where it comes from. Wow. Uh, no, no, so it, it's real. It isn't a jargon phrase. It's real people that would not have died if they'd had prompt treatment from the system. Nice. And the system is the responsibility of the government. So that, that's the point I'm making. Okay, so, so, so people die in hospital, but these are people, the, the phrase excess death could, could instead be replaced by the phrase needless death. They shouldn't have died. They ought not to have died. And had the system been uh, not, as you say, broken, but had the system been up and running at its optimum, these people would be alive today. They might well be home with their wives and children. They might be going out for dinner with their friends tonight. They might be working productively in the community, but they're dead. And they're dead because of deficiencies, failings and breakdowns in the NHS. Right now, we've got that out there. And that is a big, big deal. So then it sounds to me as though when this um, health chief says, you know, hospital's the absolute worst place to be. You're at least to some extent agreeing with him, or or do you no, disagree? I'm, I'm Tell me I'm, what you're. So, what are your thoughts on what he said then? Well, well, well you, you see, what we've just discussed is the whole pathway. Somebody becomes ill, and the whole pathway leads to an, an increase in likelihood of death. So, you, you could die at home waiting for an ambulance. I heard one shocking story from uh, from somebody in uh, one of the ambulance unions where somebody had had a heart attack uh, at home, knew that they were going to wait an unconscionable delay for an ambulance, got mm. a taxi and arrived at the hospital dead in the back of the taxi. Oh, my gosh. Uh, that doesn't mean the, the hospital is a, is a dangerous place mm. or, or, or a taxi is a dangerous place. It means that the whole system is under such pressure. Now, I... I, I came from the from a physiotherapy picket today at my local hospital in Lewisham. Mm. Um, they are under huge pressure. The, the I've been on two really strident, impressive nurses demonstrations on the RCN days of strike. The the public meet these events with huge support and solidarity. We're organising. And I, when I say we, uh, Keeper Anxious Public is in an alliance, SOS NHS, and the, 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 that makes sense to everybody, SOS NHS, and we've got a demonstration on the 11th of March from Tottenham Court Road to Westminster, and we're asking people to tell the government they've got to declare a crisis and act. Well, got to what will it mean if they do? If they do, if the government says the yeah. NHS is in crisis, and we've heard the phrase, we're very familiar with that one, because that was the one that was constantly used during COVID when the government kept on saying, and all the spokespeople kept on saying, we just hope that the NHS is, is preserved from being in crisis. We're trying to save the NHS from being engulfed in a crisis. So we're familiar with the concept of this. Um, what does it mean if the government does formally declare the NHS to be in crisis? What will that do, if anything? I think it would mean putting aside the, the storyline that's a kind of gaslighting of the whole nation and, and the NHS that, that there isn't really a crisis. It's because GPs don't open at weekends or, or because they're not working hard enough or the ambulance strikes are, are causing these problems. All of these are, is, are gaslighting, and they're not answering the question that after 13 years, that they've planned completely, they've lacked, they've lacked planning to, pl to develop the workforce. We've got insufficient nurses, doctors, physiotherapists, MRI scanners, hospital beds, community nurses, and social care is enormous, Vanessa. Um, the... the there's a stark contrast. This is a slight diversion, but I think one of the questions for the public is follow the money. Mm -hmm. You know, we've had your report about Nadim Zahawi and mm -hmm. how he lost track of four million pounds in tax, and we've had the same issues about Rishi Sunak and his family 
uh, you know, pay, paying non-dom uh, tax avoidance. By his wife, yeah. His wife, yeah, his family, yeah. And um, in, in social care, there's a, a huge anomaly that the majority of social care is run privately. Now, the problem with, with that is that there's a chunk of that at the time when individual care homes don't have enough money to pay their staff properly, the, the, the hedge funds that run a chunk of social care are siphoning off absolutely huge profits uh, out of the social care funding that local authorities are paying them, and it goes off out, offshore to the Cayman Islands or somewhere. So we, we, we need to, if it's a public service, we need value for money. And that should be a principle that every politician adheres to, but they are not adhering to it. We, we need to not only um, throw £200 million at emergency care beds, we need, we need social care to be respectful. We need it to allow independent living for disabled people, safe care for those that cannot live independently, and not dump, dump them sort of in a hotel somewhere or in a social care that suits them, suits the system, but they need to be near their families, near their communities, and that has failed to happen for decades, and, and that is one of the huge issues here, and part of the jigsaw puzzle, part of the production line that needs to be fixed. We need excellent social care. We need social care workers who, with health care workers, lost 2,000 lives in the pandemic. We need them to be paid way better than minimum wage, way better than uh, the, the, the national living wage. We need, we need them to be paid on a par with the, the health staff that, that deliver safe and health, safe and good health care in the, in the hospitals or the community. And we, we need that to unblock the system and, and all the NHS staff also who are leaving the health service in their tens of thousands need to know that they are respected once again by a government that is capable of that. Dr. Tony O'Sullivan, thanks very much indeed for joining me. I'm taking your call.